Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third session of our course on tactics of agroecological transition. Um, today, we'll talk about the question of land. And just to situate what we'll be discussing today in relation to the whole course, I think we, we could say that there are four immediate needs for agroecological transition, which is knowledge, knowledge sharing, uh, it's access to labor and the process of actually producing things differently. It's distribution channels, access to markets or other forms of distribution of agroecological produce, and it's access to land. So this whole course is, is, is a way of trying to common lang put language in com uh, knowledge in common. Um, and last week we spoke about the question of labor, the question also around justice and the fight of exploitation against exploitation in, in agriculture. Um, and next week we'll we'll speak about this the question of producing other forms, other economies, other distribution channels. Today we'll speak about the question of land. Uh, and of course, as we all know, there's a long-term tendency of agricultural uh, land to be to be uh, concentrated in big farms. Um, and land is becoming more and more expensive, especially uh, in Western and Northern Europe, but per, uh, fertile productive land anywhere. Um, and this tendency towards um, towards a concentration of agricultural land is also happening in Eastern Europe, where there was briefly a process in the other direction after uh, collectivized farms were, were abolished. Um, so this, this is something that we've been uh, doing, Manu and I, different radio shows about with the Earthcare uh, Fieldcast, where we talk to um, to Attila Soc from uh, Romania, from Ecuadorales, where they're fighting against land grabs. Uh, we also have interviews with our guests uh, today, Isabella Truisi from Mundeji, uh, and uh, Jost from the from the German Acker Syndicate, and and uh, and with the ABL from from where we have Anna today. Um, so you can check out those um, radio shows. So uh, in our introductory session, we talked to, well, especially Daniel Lopez Garcia um, talked about how we can, we can work with or as uh, agroecological producers in order to change the, the uses of, usage of existing lands. Um, today, we'll talk more about how to get access to land if you don't already have it. Um, and so the three examples we have of this, of, of different tactics and strategies for doing this, are from uh, Italy and Germany. Um, first, we'll have Isabella Truisi from Mondeggi Bene Comune or Mondeggi Commons uh, talk to us about this experience outside of Florence in Italy, where for almost 10 years, uh, there's been a big agricultural estate occupied um, and where they're now working to transform this occupation into something uh, that they call um, civic land use, which is recognized by the municip municipality who owns the land. We'll also talk to or hear from Jost from the German Acker Syndicate, which is developing a, a model for cooperative uh, land ac acquisition. And finally, we have Anne, and also in the, in, later in the breakout room, we have Anastasia also from, from the ABL, which is a German part of La Via Campesina. We're campaigning for what they call Gemeinwohlverpachtung, which we could translate as uh, common good leasage of public lands. Um, so we were also hoping, and we have this in the program, that uh, Nadine from, from our team would talk about the, the big socialization conference in Germany last year that she was part of organizing, which is a part of a big movement in Germany that talks about expropriation of land, socialization of land. Uh, but sadly, Nadine is sick, but this is something we can have in the back of our minds that that's actually becoming a big discourse in Germany now. This question of so socializing land also through uh, through public measures. So everybody, okay. Anne from the ABL now, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the German Via Campesina. She will introduce herself. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, yeah, so I'm Anne from the ABL. Um, yeah, that's quite spontaneous for right now, but I think it will work. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Gemeinwohl um, Verpackungskampagne, um, which uh, Wu already mentioned. Um, in English, it's the Common Good Lease Campaign. 
And I'm also talking like a little bit um, about the general work or the demands of the AVL. So the AVL is the German, um, how to say that, part of um, La Via Campesina. That's the Arbeitsgemeinschaft Bäuerliche Landwirtschaft. And uh, common demands. I think I have to switch the screen again. <laughs> because if not, I can't see like I uh, can't see what I've written to. So the AVL is demanding um, common good interest instead of peak um, price. Um, we also, um, yeah, are fighting for um, a cultural landscape rich in species and structures uh, for diverse agriculture instead of area concentration for a few. And um, we're talking about regional implementation of a rural agriculture. Um, so um, we're insisting um, that um, we can't um, separate the social from the um, from the scientific or from the agricultural work. Um, and uh -huh. yeah, Very yes. Can you maybe make it full screen and then jump out? Because people are saying they can't read what it says on the slide now. Uh, it's Yeah, it's also a bit, um, maybe it's kind of a problem because it's written in German. So these are the general demands okay. of the AVL, but maybe I can try to translate some of them. Hmm. Um, so in fact, the AVL is fighting um, against agrogene um, or genetic modified agriculture. Um, They are fighting for uh, restructuring the um, the animal. Um, oh, we I have to structure myself a bit more. <laughs> and they are fighting for climate justice as well, um, and for a lot of progressive. Um, yeah, they have a lot of progressive demands um, in perspective of the agriculture. So what I want to talk about today is more about the land. So um, the AVL is also fighting against the, um, so in Germany, a lot of farms, like in other parts of the world, they have to give up, um, especially the small scale farms. And the AVL is um, fighting for them in a political way to um, to create structures that can um, uh, yeah, help them. Um, And so it's a lot about the land rest distribution as well. Um, so I want I will make it very short. So the soil degradation uh, degradation worldwide. Um, I think it's nothing new for all of you, but I want to yeah have like a little introduction. So we're losing um, the land. Seventy five percent of the whole world's land area has now been degraded, degraded by erosion, salinization, overexploitation, or drying out. And um, globally, an area of a lot, a lot, like here it's written, it's 4.18 million square kilometers is lost every year due to soil degradation. And that is half the size of the year. You. Um, so we have this, um, all this topic of the, um, I think I have to make it short again, <laughs> like this again. Um, so we have this um, scarce resource, the soil. I think it's the most important livelihood we have needed for food production, for plants, animals, anything that we can eat. So everything depends on the soil. It's also the living space and we have less and less fertile soil at our disposal. So um, the sealing and soil degradation because of erosion, we have less fertile soils because of the farming methods of the past century, the less land gripping that is... Um, a big topic um, everywhere in the world, as well in Germany, especially in the East. Um, we have these non-agricultural investors and the access to land, for example, for people who want to become farmers is very difficult. Um, so all of this is like um, part of the problem and um, the AVL is trying to um, fight it and they started the Common Good Lease campaign um, so here you can see some people um, from the east of Germany who started um, the campaign. Um, and it's about, um, so they created like guidelines for the politics. So it's about the leasing topic because we often have um, the situation that the land isn't leased to the people who are, um, who are, yeah, working the land in a, um, in a sustainable way or in a social sustainable or ecological sustainable way, but it's about the peak price. So it's very, um, yeah, it's not a fair distribution of the land. 
Um, so the RBA created these um, guidelines for, um, for the municipalities. So it's about the municipal administration so that they have guidelines to decide who got land and who doesn't. Um, and in these um, guidelines, there are a lot of um, aspects, for example, the climate protection and nature um, conservation, as well as the maintenance and the construction of rural farms. Um, so this campaign wants to fight um, the land allocation um, and it wants to um, create or yeah, to establish a fair access to land. Um, right now, more or less 10% of the um, of the soil is publicly publicly owned um, by local authority districts, the municipalities. And yeah, so the RBL is fighting for more transparency. <laughs> and um, we also um, try to um, to bring out the topic um, to the public. Um, and one thing is that um, this is, I think this is quite interesting is that in the in Berlin, for example, we have this movement which is called Deutsche Wohnen und Co. Eignen, and they are like fighting the rents so that the people um, can afford um, the living spaces. Um, so they are trying to expropriate um, this big con, um, this big how to say it, yeah, this big concerns, uh, not concerns. This is not the right word. Um, who are owning the, the houses in Berlin. And I think it's pretty similar to what the AVL is doing with the Common Good Lease campaign. So it's quite the same problem and a similar way um, to face it. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I also brought a short video of the Common Good Lease campaign, but it, it's also in German. So I'm not sure if I um, should show it or if it's not so interesting. Um, but maybe we can have like a short look. Okay. Um, I will try to make it do 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 to make it big for you or oh, at full screen. Oops. Okay. I don't. Can you hear the sound of it? No. No. I think. Okay, maybe I have to allow it somewhere. Playing videos in over Zoom often requires quite specific skills. But I can mm -hmm. post the video into the chat if you want, and then people can open it on their browser for watching. Okay, so we can do it like this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is, I think this is other new computers. They don't, uh, yeah. You can't hear the noise. Okay. Yeah, so maybe you can have a look or you, you can have a look um, later, but I think it's a very nice um, video like summarizing um, the campaign. And the RBL is also, but I think I'm running out of time. So maybe I will just like mention another um, thing. Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, sorry for the chaotic presentation. <laughs> it's, like... it's totally fine. Also, don't stress. I mean, you do have like four more minutes, so, you know. Ah, okay, nice. Okay, so I also want to um, present it, but this has nothing to do with the AVL. But in the, um, the north of Hessen, there has been a field occupation. Um, and it started in 2019. So it's like... A, space it's like it's about um, 80 hectares and they wanted to seal it um, and it was a former the soil was um, owned by the federal state of Hessen and they wanted to create a logistic center or they wanted to construct a logistic center which uh, would mend a lot of um, destruction of the region because they had to um, they would have to um, construct also a lot of highways and so on. And there was a citizens initiative that started first. And then there was like a quite good cooperation of activists, politicians and the citizens initiative. So this um, field occupation, um, yeah, it, it developed over the time with a lot of actors and they worked together quite good. Um, and in the end, so... Um, the slogan was, we are the investment risk. And in the end, this land could be saved. Um, and it was, it was saved 
um, somehow because of the year occupation, but also because parts of the citizens initiative, they um, funded like a new party, um, which was called Midtjylland and Neufeu Eichenberg. And in the elections, they got more than 30%. Um, so they could like just, um, yeah, make it safe that the land won't be sealed and is used as agricultural soil. Um, so I think the interesting part is also that this wasn't just like a resistance, um, but they also started to grow vegetables and to distribute them to the peoples of the village, to the people of the village. So it was also um, the, the, yeah, the establishment of um, growing vegetables without an exchange logic. Um, yeah, so I think um, this was quite successful. And I think right now there's a new field occupation starting in the, um, I think it must be near Wolfsburg. Um, and it's against uh, a new fabric that VW wants to create there. Um, so I think um, the conclusion is that, um, so I have brought like some questions. So why are the two sections on land policy in Germany, or I don't know how this is in other countries, but I think it would might be interesting to discuss about that, how these two sections on land policy could merge um, together. Um, so the city um, land policy and the country um, soil policy, um, what does it take um, to do so? And is there something to fight for and win together? Um, yeah, and I think it would be quite interesting to have an ex yeah an exchange an exchange about that how this is in other countries. Um, yeah, I think um, other people are talking about soil too today, so I think maybe this is enough for <laughs> to say for the AVL. Um, But maybe it would be interesting to think about a Europe-wide um, common good list campaign because this one was like. Um, mainly in Germany, and I think it would be interesting to um, have it in a larger scale. Um, yeah, I think uh, this would, yeah, I think this is it. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, super amazing and actually really cool also to start off with an imaginary of a possible common campaign. Uh, so um, very nice energy I think you give us with that. I just want to say quickly that um, in the chat, I post the link to the document, which is in German, unfortunately, but where there's an outline of all the points of what criteria, at least for the common good, should be based on, right? Um, and um, I think in the breakout room, for whoever is interested in discussing this, we can look through the PDF together and translate uh, some of these criteria into English. So you can have a sense of those very concrete demands, uh, which are to do with labor rights as much as, you know, kind of ecological criteria and um, and different other criteria. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot, Anne, and really cool that you brought these questions. I think those questions you bring, Anne, are super cool to keep talking about later. Um, yeah, and um, I think we could maybe pass over to Jost because that would also keep us in Germany for now. I'm not sure if the video issue of Isabella has been resolved, but I think, okay. But it has, okay. But Jost is ready to go. So um, thank you, Jost, for being with us. Does that work? Yes, nice. Oh. <clears throat> so, yes, so um, yeah, we stay in Germany and I will present the ACA syndicate right now having a more, I'd say, project-based approach than a, a larger institutional political approach, um, which is a very nice addition, I think. And yeah. And so what we're doing is we try to organize land and farms as commons uh, decentrally. And maybe, Manu, you can just go on. Or, like, I try to have a short outline of what I'm doing today. Um, so first I will present what we're doing actually, what's the academic cup, what's its background. Then I try to figure out for myself what actually is our tactic for agroecological transition. I think it's not that easy to say. Um, and then to explain uh, how we uh, pursue that tactic. And then afterwards maybe come to some problems that arrived so far and some lessons we think we have learned. Um, yeah, so maybe you can go on and I'll 
try to explain briefly what the Arca Syndicate is. Um, the Arca Syndicate is um, a decentralized solidarity network of self-organized farms. That means that there are several farms that are owned by the people who live there and work there and um, that are connected via a solidarity network. Um, and the aim is to ensure that the agricultural land always belongs to those who manage and use it in an ecologically and also socially uh, responsible manner um, and that it can't be sold anymore. Uh, so that once the, the project becomes part of the Akka Syndicate, the land is saved like forever and uh, can't be pushed back uh, on the capitalist market. Um, so it is not private property anymore. It is collective property, but the collective can't even sell it. So like they can do whatever they want with their land as long as they treat it um, ecologically, um, but they can't resell it. And so that's that's one of the main reasons the Akasuni card exists to have this insurance um, that the land will stay uh, like it is and not be sold. Um, the other one is for helping this project also and counsel, give counsel on legal issues and financial and social issues and so on, and also have financial aids uh, for projects. Yeah, maybe you can go on. Um, and maybe it's, um, it's useful to know where it comes from. So in Germany, there's like, like Anna said, there's a link to the housing movement, and we also have that link. Uh, the syndicate derives from the Mietshäuser syndicate, um, which has more than 200 projects so far, I think, uh, founded in the late 80s, um, which is similar to the Acker syndicate, but just for housing projects and like very old so far. So like 30 years, 200 projects, very experienced with. And so there, the houses are bought and can't be uh, sold anymore. And it's working very, very good so far. And uh, also from the community supported agriculture movement. So the idea in fact was like, okay, we have this very well functioning Mietzhäuser syndicate, uh, this housing syndicate in Germany. And then we have like um, a community supported agriculture. So how can we try to bring it together to have some solution for uh, a decentral uh, land ownership construction so that the land land can't be sold anymore and the projects are like together in solidarity. So we founded this uh, Akka Syndicate uh, three years ago and last year we have since last year we have our first project and there's some more in the process and um, yeah we think we'll grow uh, a lot in the next years. There's a large interest so far. This is very well uh, nice and yeah let's see how it works but so we are still in the beginning um we've worked a lot on like legal structures financial structures like a lot of background work and now it's we're getting really into the work with uh talking to a lot of projects and trying to get more into the the concrete stuff yeah maybe you can go on manu uh just Maybe for understanding how we do what we're doing is let's look again back at the Mietzhäuser syndicate because we like copied a lot from them. And like them is also us, like I'm also part of the Mietzhäuser syndicate and other people in the like, syndicate too. Um, so there like every house has an own association and these houses are members in the head association of the Mietzhäuser syndicate. And this, um, association that owns another um, a limited liability um, their construction and this then this GmbH is called in Germany is limited then possesses a part of every project so and that there would be a need for consensus of all the projects um, to resell one project, which will never happen because all the projects are there to ensure that no project will be sold. So like, um, that's the main idea, how it works and it worked super well so far. Like it's a bit complicated legal stuff here, but yeah, <laughs> that's one of our problems. Um, yeah, maybe we can go on. Um, 
like just some impressions of meat sources in the card to show like that this stuff is real and we can just go on for time issues. Um, so I tried to figure out what is our tactic and I hope it was like some uh, how clear what we're doing. I think one of our tactic is to work on legal structures and legal hacks. So like legal hack meaning trying to use the legal uh, capitalist system um, system that is all built up on private private property and then within this uh, legal system finding something that is like the opposite of private property um that is the hack we're trying to do and it's not easy to transfer to other countries because the legal it's a lot about uh laws and so on and they're different <laughs> in every country so like some main ideas can be transferred for example from the meat sources there has been uh, it has been copied in several other countries and adapted to the local uh, needs and it works quite well so far um, but yeah it's a lot of work every time um, yeah so I just wrote down what we really do there like and I explained it also. And um, then another one is like working on solidarity. Um, because a problem I see in many like small rural projects is, is that they're isolated and working for themselves. And by that they lose their political impact. And uh, with the solidarity network, we can uh, have a bridge between the project and like uh, push the broader political ideas that connect us and have some real impact. And also it's easier for every project if you have older projects that have had the same issues, which is very useful if you have the same legal and financial structure and so on on every project, because then the, exactly the same uh, problems arise for every project and usually they have been solved so far and you just have to copy the solutions from others. And so there's this Solidarity with also with finances because older projects like have uh, don't have the expenses and gain money usually so they they can give some money to a newer project to support them but the solidarity transfers also from the new projects to the old projects because the old project have the pro problem that at some point they get stuck um, like they don't have the initial drive anymore like hey, we're doing some cool crazy project here we're changing the world and everything they just got established and they're doing their stuff and they don't really know what for anymore and so on and there the, these new, pro new projects bring in some ideas and enthusiasm uh, which is very enriching and yeah that's one of the basic ideas and then what is really important like the decentral work there's no centralized land ownership there are a lot of cooperatives in Germany and also in other uh, countries, for example, in France or in uh, Austria, there are other organizations pursuing similar means, but also always with a central structure. And for, in our point of view, like more from an anarchist perspective, it's not good to have this centralized. I have some more <laughs> theoretical thoughts about that in the presentation or another presentation, I think, but it's too de detailed here. But like we think that it's important not to centralize uh, land ownership because then there's a lot, lot of concentration of power uh, and we don't want that. Yeah. So maybe we can go on. Um, I don't know, how, how much time do I have left? Maybe a two, three minutes, does that work? Or is that yeah, different? okay, yeah, <laughs> I, I'll try. <laughs> okay, um, so here's, I, I think it's interesting to have a closer look on this financial solidarity transfer we are doing. So this here is from the Mitzvah Syndicate, but it will be like, it is the same in the Akka Syndicate, um, but they have the material. Um, so on the left hand, you see side, you see how the economy of the normal house functions, like you have the initial costs, and then they go down and then you make the profit. And in the syndicate model, like you have the same cost and so on, but you don't make the profit. But, um, and you could just lower all the costs you have, like to say, okay, we don't pay any rent anymore and so on. It's really on a lower level. 
and we're economically very well suited and let's don't care about the rest of the world but we think that no one is free until all of us are free so like the people having a good economy established in their project should use it to support other project and that is like this solidarity uh, contribution of the surplus um yeah so by this there's really a lot of money generated so that new projects can more easily be started because in the beginning there's always the problem of finances yeah and maybe you can go on i i have this legal structure how it works maybe we i'd, I'd skip it because it's like to i already explained it a bit and yeah i have no more time um so i try to uh, resume what are the problems and lessons learned so far. So I'd say it works, like this one, <laughs> one lesson that's quite important, I think. And another lesson is that legal questions and financial detailed questions are annoyingly complicated. And there are not a lot of people who are really into it and say like, yeah, I mean, I have time and energy. I want to work about some paragraphs and uh, numbers. So um, like, it's not that easy to uh, have a good team of motivated people around this. And yeah, that's one uh, problem. And also going around with this is that like, you need a lot of specialized knowledge. So if you want to get into the project and want to support the Akasunika, like you have to get around like one or two years until you fully understand what's going on um, and to and then to council projects and so on. So that's, uh, a lot of time needed and the time investment like from people and also problems of hierarchy i mean people are knowing things other people don't know the things and it's yeah that's a big problem well, not a big problem but it's like a subject we have to work about and then uh one problem is like social issues and small rural groups like we have the is like it's based on small rural groups and um, like if there's one social conflict and the group breaks apart, then like it can ruin the project. And um, we think that we really have to focus more on uh, social issues. Um, yeah, that's something we learned also from Meet Sources in the because there are some uh, rural projects uh, with not so many people uh, like <laughs> this, like destroyed today, and that's a big problem. And the Akka Syndicate will be almost only these projects. So it's a big problem we have to face so far. Then old farms are often complicated. Maybe you know it. <laughs> and uh, like, yeah, it's uh, the land is too expensive. That's why, why we're doing what we're doing. But it makes it harder to do what we are doing. Yeah, so like, I, that's, that's it for today. <laughs> like, uh, I'm very interested in uh talking to you in the breakout room about like if maybe there are people having similar approaches um in their countries and how it could be possible to transfer this model to other countries but also about like some questions i i raised like about social problems or hierarchies in a group and so on yeah thanks Thank you, yes. clap 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 <laughs> Lots of questions coming up. Um, super amazing. Anecdotal evidence is uh, the where where we are sitting. Bu and I is uh, the housing corp where we live in, which is the Austrian kind of spin-off of the Mietshäuser Syndicat. Um, so this model has spread already quite widely, but the Austrian model doesn't have a farm version yet. <laughs> I heard there are people who want to set this up too. But yes. Um, and do check out the podcast, which I posted ages ago. We can repost it with Jost and Anne, where there is more detail still about um, those two campaigns uh, and those two kind of approaches and also the dialogue between them. I just want to mention this. Thanks. Um, so now, uh, before we go over to Isabella, uh, I just want to encourage everyone to post the questions in the chat. Keep them coming, and uh, I'm really happy to introduce Isabella Trisi from Mondeggi Bene Comune, um, Mondeggi Commons outside of Florence. Um, and it, it's a really interesting story that's been going on for more than ten years. And if you want to really go into depth with the story, you should listen to the to our, our new podcast where uh, Laura and I from Common Ecologies made a, a a long interview with Isabella. That's very nice to listen to. 
So uh, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy that finally you can see me. Um, so yeah, as Boy was saying, I was I would suggest really to everyone who has uh, time to have a, a look at the podcast because really to uh, try to brief our experiences in 10 minutes, it's super difficult. I'll try to do my best. Um, I will have to share the screen and I'm really excited to share our experience today and also to have the chance to discuss with others who are working on the same issues because I think we are facing common problems and challenges. Um, just a second, I want to... Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. yes. I just want to have a full screen here. I'm trying, just a second. Um, Okay, maybe. Um, I would like to remove here the well, I don't know how to hide the videos on the um, well, I just think I will go on like this, but I cannot put the presentation on full screen. It's in full screen. We see it in full screen at least. Okay, you see it full screen? Yes, okay, yes. great then. Um, okay, so also if I skip the slide, you can see it. Great. Yes, right now we're in the front, right? In the cover. Okay, perfect. So Mundeji is um, a rural occupation of land. It's a collective project. It um, started in 2014. I will just be very brief here with the history, but I really have to give some uh, details about how it all started. So. Mondeggi uh, was born from the from a collective in Florence, which was called Terra Bene Comune, which means land as commons. And this collective was born in Florence to fight against the selling and privatization of public lands in Italy. Because in 2011, due to economic recession, the, the government um, decided to sell public lands to, um, to have like budget for our cri economic crisis. And so this collective was fighting against the selling and impri privatization of public lands. And in Florence, there was this very huge farm, which was abandoned uh, since five or six years. And before it used to be a public firm where they were cultivating olive trees and vineyards, but all through conventional agriculture. So they were using chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, and it was really intensive and monocultural agriculture. So when the municipality of Florence announced the will to sell the property, the Terra Bene Comune Collective decided to set up a fight against the selling of this land. We are talking of a huge um, land. It's about 200 hectares. Uh, we have more than 11,000 olive trees on this land, as well as 12 hectares of vineyards and gardens, as well as eight buildings, all historical buildings and a villa from the Renaissance. The farm is located 12 kilometers away from Florence. So it is an area where land has a very high economic value and it's really exclusive. It's almost impossible to find a piece of land to buy or to rent in this area because being so close to the city and especially to Florence, which we all know it's a really touristic city and it's been in the last years, a huge source of profits and the land here is really high valued. So this, this movement was fighting against this exclusiveness of land in this area and wanted to reclaim access to land for everyone. And so when the municipality of Florence declared that they wanted to sell this huge public property, um, negotiations started on behalf of the collective uh, with institutions to reclaim a collective ownership and collective management of this land and some form of public redistribution of the land. So when the negotiations turned out, um, didn't turn out well, because in the end, in 2014, the municipality of Florence declared their will 
to keep on with the alienation and privatization of this land through a public auction. So the buyers would most probably be um, really like rich uh, privates and companies because the value of the property is was really high. So against this, in 2014, the land was occupied. Before that, there were already um, other symbolic collective actions like the recovery of the olive trees. So before the occupation, uh, there was a collective olive harvesting for, and these olives were used to make olive oil that was then freely distributed to the population of the area. So Mundeji was occupied in 2014, and since then, um, a project of collective management of this land started. Um, we are we have occupied three buildings that are located in the in this land, and in the last nine years, um, we built a community that is now involving more than 300 people in the management of this place. And since the occupation, we did not only reclaim the need of this land to remain public, but also tried to reconvert these crops that were already on this land to through agroecology. So a place that was previously run through industrial and chemical agriculture was collectively um, transitioned through, through agroecology and ecological collective practices. So the main threads of political actions and let's say our values and practices that were developed in the last years, of course, are dealing with the issue of agroecology, which is not just, of course, a practice of a way for producing food and agriculture, but it's also a social movement which sees uh, agriculture as something that is deeply social and deeply related to the ecological realm and ecological relations. And of course, um, our main focus is that of access to land and genuine food. And this, of course, was organized through um, health organization and finding collective strategies and tactics to manage this land collectively. And then the issue of food sovereignty and the ecological regeneration of the territory, but also trying to share peasant knowledge and try to, to share knowledge related to earth care, to food production, and um, how to produce food in a genuine way and collectively. So our main tactics, what, what I think worked um, in the experience of Mondeji regarding this experiment of collective land management was the experiment of redistributing the land. So there are there is a group of people in Mondeji who are the inhabitants, so 20, 25 people more or less, including me who live in the houses uh, that are located in the place. And then the rest of the, of the community is taking care of the land through re redistribution. So all the olive trees, vineyards and the land, also gardens where people can grow their vegetables were redistributed to people of the territory who could make a request coming through to the assembly for taking care of a parcel of olive trees and each year, each family has its own uh, amount of olive oil and wine, organic olive oil, organic wine that they can use for self-consumption. The only thing we request people to have access to this land is to take part in the community activities, in the assemblies, and in all the in the taking care of this place. This is what really worked with Mondeji, and I think it's what made made the project last all over this years because it helped to um, create very strong relationships with the territory. Most of the people who are working here are people from the area of Florence and surroundings who have their piece of land here and work with us. And this really helped the project to, um, to have a recognition in the territory. Uh, then we tried in the last years to really um, share peasant knowledge and agroecological knowledge, organizing uh, La Scuola Contadina, which means a uh, peasant school. So basically in the school, we um, organize each year free courses of different activities, beekeeping, bread making, wild herbs, um, organic 
olive trees, organic wine, how to, how to produce organic olive oil and organic wine, and many others. Um, and we try to experiment with collective economy and running a farm, basically starting with no money. It's a collective project that started with nothing and we try to set up a farm. So we divided ourselves into groups of production. So each one of us takes part in one group and we, in nine years, we were able to um, produce many different products like organic beer, organic olive oil, wine, bread, um, and we sell our products to local organic farmers market. So this is our bread, for example. Um, as regards internal organization, we found um, a situation in which we have two levels of assemblies. Um, one, it's the assembly of the inhabitants uh, of, the, of the place, so the people that actually live in the project. And then there is a general assembly, which is the larger assembly of the community. And it's where most of the decisions related to the projects are, are taken. And these assemblies, as you can imagine, are very numerous. There's a lot of people taking part. And so we had to find each and every time the better, better ways to make them work. I, I'm not sure if we succeeded in that yet, but we, we are trying. And in Mondeji, I think what it's um, interesting is that we are close to the city, so close that we were able to build also solidarity and a lot of connections with the urban movements and the urban public space. So basically through the means of self-organized farmers markets, through an autonomous farmers network, we occupied public squares to reclaim uh, the right of farmers to sell their food in the city. And this actually worked because through the occupation of the squares, we were able to have an authorization from the municipality for our, for our markets. And this is something we achieved in one year of struggle, keeping on occupying the, the squares for our, our market. And we were able to involve also other farmers of the area in, the, in this process. Um, so basically after nine years of experiments and laboratory of practices and tactics, um, there are, of course, a lot of challenges that um, I tried to uh, summarize here as issues of internal democracy and how do we relate with institutions and the recognition, because right now Mondeji is going through uh, a phase of uh, legalization from the on behalf of the institutions, because um, we institutions are now the municipality of Florence is now receiving funding from the EU um, with the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. We are having funds to renovate all the buildings in Mondeji and we are participating in this process of um, imagining Mondeji in the future and we will be the association that will take part in this process. But this of course raises issues of autonomy and how do we deal and how do we keep our autonomy when dealing with institutions and then other challenges, and I'm got coming to an end here. Um, it's the contrast sometimes between individual and collective well-being in a community that is so complex and where it's so difficult to manage how to um, how to balance individual life in the community and collective work and collective activities, power relations within the group, um, and then. How can we create autonomous livelihoods in a capitalist economy, which still, um, which still obliges us to have certain specific um, needs in terms of money? So we were able to build an internal self-sufficient economy, but we're not able to guarantee our livelihoods, for example. And so I would really like also to focus on this aspect. How can we balance this? So I really hope I gave, gave a clear idea of the project and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Isabella. Really beautiful.